start your uh, recording. Recording at this point. Well, uh, good morning or good afternoon, uh, everybody, wherever you are in the country or in the world. This is our uh, regular uh, Saturday session from Apna Merit, uh, where we bring experts uh, from uh, within USA and mostly who have done work in outside in Pakistan, expert mostly in uh, healthcare and healthcare related uh, fields. So uh, today, actually, we have uh, we are actually I'm you know pleased and honored to have Dr. Zulfkar Bhutta. I honestly, I'm, I'm, I'm senior like uh, some of you here, and I have not known many, many people in healthcare field who are from Pakistan and, and have done so much to help with healthcare globally and nationally where he is. So let me introduce him. Dr. Zulfkar Bhutta is a founding uh, director for Center of Excellence in Women and Child Health uh, at the Institute of Global Health and Development uh, at Aga Khan in Karachi, Pakistan. Uh, he's also director of Center for Excellence in Women and Child Health at Institute of Global Health and Development. Uh, and uh, he's also Harding Chair or Inaugural Chair of uh, Global Child Health and co-director of Sick Kids Center for Global Health in Toronto, Canada. Uh, Dr. Bhutta, most of you know, also is uh, chairman, uh, board of directors for NIH, where he also advises. And he has done a lot of work uh, in Africa, Pakistan, and other countries, Toronto, Canada, obviously, uh, related to global health, and has received in 21 and in 22 then uh, very prestigious awards, one of them uh, called John um, Dirks Canada Gardner 22 Global Health Award. And also last year, he got an award uh, from a Rocks Prize uh, recipient in, in Canada. Uh, his topic today is uh, uh, basically how public health and science research in Pakistan and how people who are outside the pa Pakistan can help uh, improve that. Uh, before I give it to Dr. Bhutta, I'm quickly going to introduce two of our panelists here today. One of them is my buddy, my friend, uh, from my college mate from RME, Shahid Rafiq, who uh, was the, actually one of the first person who started this Apna Merit, and he pulled me in, and we've been working together. Uh, and then uh, Dr. Klimullah, who is a, a lead executive and clinical diagnostic systems uh, program at veteran uh, hospitals in Little Rock, Arkansas. So I think Shahid, once Dr. Zulafkar uh, finishes talk, then you guys can say a few words about you before we do the question answers. But at this point, I think we're gonna give, uh, give it to Dr. Bhutta and please uh, educate us on what uh, you have learned by working in all these places. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bhutta. Well, thank you very much, firstly, for asking me to speak to you today. Uh, I am greatly honored to, to be asked to speak on a topic uh, which is very close to my heart. And I hope that at least, the very least, uh, today will leave you with a little bit of food for thought in terms of how we might proceed together in this space. Um, so I want to start with some declarations and caveats. I mean, I've had a pole position, alhamdulillah, in uh, science and policy in Pakistan for upwards of two and a half decades. I served as the review lead panel chair at the Higher Education Commission earlier on in between 2002 and six, and I'm presently the chair. So I've seen also how things have changed. I was a member of the Biotechnology Commission of the government earlier on, and I founded the National Vaccine Development Task Force and chaired it was an advisor to the PMRC and chaired the, uh, and founded the first National Research Ethics Committee uh, between 2002 and 14. And, uh, and as mentioned, I now direct the Board of Governors of the National Institutes of Health. But that also means that the views that I'm presenting today are not institutional views. These are personal and they do not represent the state position of any of the aforementioned organizations and bodies and that should be recognized. Uh, what I would like to do 
in the next 30 to 40 minutes is to cover uh, the chronology of health policy in Pakistan and how have things changed and how priorities changed over time. Talk a little bit about health burden uh, that we know and can influence decisions around health research. Uh, our standing in this field, which is very important. What is Pakistan doing around health research and health sciences in particular? I will spend a significant amount of time on, on discussing the research financing or funding currently. What are the opportunities and bodies that fund uh, uh, research in Pakistan, both from the public sector and outside of the public sector? Uh, what emerged from recent prioritization exercises for research and then the role of the diaspora and what we could do together. And I see that I say that with great humility because I'm part of the diaspora. I spend a big chunk of my time now in North America uh, uh, while still taking care of my responsibilities at uh, the Aga Khan University, but I get a, a good sense of how these relationships exist. So let's uh, look at the chronology of uh, health and public health in Pakistan and how was this approached by various people. And I think it suffice it for me to say that some of the earlier years, the early two decades in Pakistan's history were seminal in terms of how people worked hard with virtually nothing, with very little at hand, in terms of establishing bodies, laying the foundations of things that still stand today. And if anything, uh, one takes great inspiration from the work of that times. So we started in 1947 with nothing one medical college, a few district civil hospitals, and a, a largely an armed forces medical services, which was established the civil public medical services, lost a lot of personnel at that time. By the early 50s, a number of reforms had begun. And JPMC was established, the Pakistan Medical Dental Council was established, and a lot of this was the brainchild of uh, General Wajid Ali Burki, who also was the person responsible for establishing the College of Physicians and Surgeons. And you can see that by the early 60s, a number of things had been put in place. And, uh, and many of these programs that you think about, family planning program, rural health program with CHWs, and I recall that as a young person because I had family members serving in this. It is also important to recognize that the governments at that time gave due importance to science and science development. One of the few high level panel meetings, which had the head of state discussing science ownership in the country was led by General Ayub Khan in Sawat in 1965. On the dais, you will see the, some of the leading lights of, of science and research in Pakistan. There is Dr. Abdul Salam sitting here. This was the only meeting, high level meeting that established so many national programs. Why? Because it had the support of the head of state who saw it befitting at that time to give it time. In the 70s, after the crisis and after the breakup of Pakistan, uh, a lot of time was spent on principally what I call establishing and reestablishing primary health care. A number of things happened. And I would give due credit to the governments at that time because you know they did sign up to the Almata Declaration and launched a number of things that we still remember today as primary care programs of importance. Uh, in the 80s, there was some consolidation uh, and a few programs, and also the private sector jumped in. So, uh, as you know, the Khan University, Bakai Medical College, Nawaya University, they were established around those time in the early 80s. And now, as you know, this sector has expanded grossly. The 90s saw a number of initiatives, of which the most notable in the health sector is the establishment of the Lady Health Workers Program by the late uh, uh, Benazir Bhutto in 1994. And a, a range of health services and health reforms activities took place. But not a lot happened around the research side for which we needed to wait till after 2000 when the Higher Education Commission was established and also a revamping of the Pakistan Medical Research Council and some research prioritization exercises took place. The National Research Ethics Committee was established also around that time in 2002. I was asked to chair it and establish it as the one mechanism for research oversight in the country. And then I would say 2010 onwards, we lost a decade. Um, everything fell into disarray with first the devolution and then the 
slow and steady deterioration of financing and funding for even bodies like PMRC. We now have a process whereby some things are being uh, re-looked at, and we'll talk a little bit about it, but you've seen how national health insurance has kicked in. The COVID-19 wake-up call and the establishment of NCOC has also given examples of really exemplary projects in Pakistan. IT-based innovations are now quite common, and, and your uh, APNA merit has also given space and ex exposure to a number of these innovations. And we have had a few activities on health research prioritization. Now, the one thing that people often tell me is that we don't know a lot about health status in Pakistan and trends, and that is not correct. We know a lot, actually a lot more than many other countries of similar size and dispositions, some of which derives from the global burden of disease that has been able to do subnational estimations. And this is the way the global burden of disease looks at various categories. It looks at mortality, causes of death, risk factors, non-fatal outcomes. And, and for Pakistan, we have a reasonable idea as to how deaths and disabilities have changed over time. This is differences between 2000 and 2019, and it'll soon be appearing as a subnational uh, estimation. We also know how risk factors have changed over time. As you can see, uh, uh, cardiovascular disease risk factors have gone up. Some of the issues around non-communicable diseases, obesity, have become more uh, widespread and known. So there is more information than we had ever before. We know a lot more about risk factors at a national and subnational level. And these risk factors are extremely important from preventive strategies. What we also know is that there are tremendous differentials. So these are data and analyzed by our group on looking at how things have changed between 1990 and 2018 in terms of various health services interventions for children and mothers. So skilled birth attendance, which was really down in the 10, 15%, has now gone up to well above 60, 70%. Each one of these dots is a district of Pakistan. So although things have gone up on average, you can see very clearly there are tremendous differentials and, uh, and disparities. And that's one of the biggest challenges in health systems and health services that we have. But be that as it may, there has been progress. And you can see that by the composite coverage index for several uh, maternal and child health interventions in Pakistan over time. And I think you can largely regard this as progress, which with the exception of Balochistan, which has its own challenges, has been fairly consistent across provinces in Pakistan. As I'd mentioned, we also know what we are not doing and who is being left behind. So on the issues of inequities, um, this is work uh, overseen by my colleague, Dr. Jay Das uh, at Aga Khan, looking at uh, what inequities exist in maternal child health interventions, and as you can see, uh, there are tremendous differentials between the poor people in the population, the red triangles here, and those who are relatively rich. And if you look at coverage levels, the rich have more access, two or three folds, if not more, than the relatively poor in the population. But these differentials are very stark when it comes to maternal health. And when you put down maternal health, family planning, these gaps become very wide. So we still have a big challenge. To, to overcome this. But you will be surprised that we also have data on subnational distribution at a granular level that people did not think possible before. Uh, for example, we are able to look at various indicators, and this is uh, skilled birth attendance, for example. And if you look at skilled birth attendance, uh, you will see that for every National Assembly constituency, if one of these areas is an MA and his or her area, um, you have variability in coverage. Often in 2008 and, and there six, or thereabouts, it was less than 20, 30%. Some improved by the mid 13s, but also by 2018, you will see many parts of the country, notably Southern Punjab and definitely parts of Balochistan left behind. So we have that level of granular information. Uh, so for those people who say we don't know much about health in Pakistan, we know a lot about health in Pakistan and much more than before. And that's one of the reasons why it's now time to move to much better, more, more granular and accurate epidemiological assessment of what needs to happen and change. Now, one parameter other than this are health science outputs in Pakistan. And I'm going to spend a few minutes on this. 
So it is true that when you look at some benchmarks, Pakistan has not done very well in terms of recognized high impact global scientists. One such measure is this ranking of Asian scientists that comes out every year and has been for the last eight, nine years. And if you look at the top 100 Asian scientists, it has, a, it has very few from Pakistan, almost none except for one in nanotechnology out of LUMS in 2020, a reasonable number of Indian scientists every year, and, and virtually none from any other places. I personally think this is a, a bit biased in terms of its focus most on South East Asia, there are a lot of uh, people from other countries and the parameters are not very clear. But just to say that in Asian scientists, Pakistan's ranking is, has not been very high in some of these indices around discovery. A year or two ago, uh, my colleague Samira Nandi and I we looked at uh, research outputs in terms of quantity and quality across South Asian countries. And as you can see in this graphic, if you just look at publications and edge indices, uh, uh, and citations, obviously India has a much larger population and therefore has a lot more citation. But if you compare edge indices, which are here in blue, not a lot of difference across countries. So it's not necessary that volume or quantity equates quality. If you compare from, um, for example, the International Science Index, which is the one source that I'm using for these analyses, although uh, the numbers from India are very high in terms of annual counts of papers. Uh, Pakistan has not done badly. Pakistan is here in blue. And in the last 10 years, you would say, there's been an exponential increase in amount of science output. So one of the questions that I'm asked is, is it all garbage? Is it good quality science? What can we say about the quality of particularly health research science output out of Pakistan? Uh, well, there are several measures. One of those is the Stanford Index which many of you know about. Um, uh, and there are about 32 um, um, scientists, health scientists out of the 137 Pakistanis who made it to the top 20%, top 2% in the Stanford's index. But this is out of several million people who are in this index out there. So yes, we have some names, but you know this is nothing to pro about. We have a few people in the 0.01% also out there. So this is one indirect measure of how many people are writing top quality science, because this is based largely on citations and, and, and standing. One other way of looking at this is, again, by looking at what we call uh, CNCI, which is the average category normalized citation impact. So if you look at these countries here from South and Southeast Asia, take, for example, just a comparison of Pakistan and India, illustratively, when India is obviously much greater GDP, and also gross expenditure on research development is about three times as much as Pakistan has uh, not as much researchers per million population as you would think, much less than what Singapore has and much less than what Malaysia has, but has five times, six times more publications. But if you look at their CNCI index, it is not higher than Pakistan, it's lower. So I would say that in terms of the quality of science productivity out of Pakistan, particularly uh, by international indices like Clarivitics, uh, uh, the international publications out of Pakistan are on the right side of the global benchmark. So pretty high impact publications, and, uh, and one should be proud of that having happened over the last few decades just by investments in promoting faculty and promoting science. We also have a reasonable number of networks. These are collaborative indices as to how does Pakistan collaborate in science. And I was particularly interested in looking at the collaboration between Pakistan and United States. Uh, this really is something uh, that ought to be a lot better than it is. Uh, and you know, this is a rating scale and it is not very high and it's not as high as many other countries in Southeast Asia. So we could do better with international collaborations. But more than international collaborations, I think, is collaboration within our region. So I've recently written about how little or negligible scientific collaboration exists within South Asia. Between India and Pakistan, you have collaboration with a lot of other countries. India is here, Pakistan is here, but virtually nothing in between. Nothing between us and Bangladesh, almost nothing between us and Nepal. And that is a major barrier in terms of working together in South Asia. 
I uh, got a chance to review this quite extensively as part of the COVID-19 experience. And we really, as an, as an area, should have done a lot better. Many of you are aware of the controversy around excess mortality in India. Pakistan has not had that kind of excess mortality, partly because of policies. And there wasn't enough discussion or exchange of ideas and information in that region, even though we paid lip service to science diplomacy. So a lot more can be done on this within the region and also, of course, uh, with, with colleagues in, in North America. Okay, so the next step that I do want to uh, touch is how did we, or how do we look at consensus around what priority areas to focus on for public health and science research? And this was something, as I mentioned, which uh, we looked at quite extensively in an early stage at the time when PMRC was set up, and then the planning commission looked at it, but it was not really a systematic process. Some of the recent exercises in this have included uh, research prioritization using standardized methods. We have the Medical Research Council did this in 2000, 2001. Then there's the National Health Vision Document, PCST, Pakistan Council of Science and Technology, uh, did such an exercise in 2017. And there have been individual efforts, but none as systematic as what was conducted in the last two years uh, between Higher Education Commission and the National Institute of Health uh, and now the Health Research uh, Institute uh, in, as part of its retreat last year that some of you participated in. And in this retreat, uh, there were a number of criteria that were looked at uh, across a range of ideas, topics, and elements. And of those, all of these were important, but it was also important to look at political prioritization. And, and equity focus was therefore considered. The priority areas that we have come up with that we are just beginning to focus on are not any different or strange in terms of what you already know. But keep this in mind that these have now also come through a national consultative process. And therefore they represent to a large extent broad priorities where investments, both from national resources and, and uh, institutions will, will take place. So the next question that arises is, how much is that investment? How much money is being spent on health research and other forms of science research in the country? Now, this has been quite difficult uh, to put together and I'm grateful to many people who have helped me in this process in collating the information. And they include you know, uh, many people who are former ministers, current heads of, uh, uh, of organization and I'm very grateful to them for sharing this data uh, in, in as complete a form as possible. So let's start with our APEX ministry, the Ministry of Science and Technology, which is responsible for science investments. And this is a summary as shared with me on development and non-development expenditures uh, over the last 20 years. So in uh, orange that you see here are the development allocation, which is basically discretionary allocation uh, that you can put into projects. And these are across the board, across all science projects. And they amount to on average around 15 to $20 million annually over the last 10 years. This is the first year, last year, that it went up to around 40 years, $40 million, largely because of advocacy by people like Dr. Thauraman. But you will see that those have been few and far between. In the early 2000s, this split that you see here is, was also because he advocated and got the government to give a lot more funds to to the Ministry of Science and Technology when he was a minister. And this happened again this time uh, after a lot of efforts. But in between, the establishment, the bureaucracy hardly gives any development money out of a ministry that's supposed to be overseeing uh, science and technology. And I can say that some of the weakest ministers that have been appointed in, in, uh, in this area have also come from the lack of attention on the importance of merit and importance of knowledge of science that is required in, in, in this discipline. The ministry also supports organizations like Science Foundation and the Science Foundation, which oversees a lot of multidisciplinary, multi-sectoral research has several of these grant opportunities that you see here. And on the right side, you will see all the allocations that it has over a period of time. So this is not much, it's about $10 million, for example, for technology innovation, public private partnership models and twinning uh, over a period of uh, three to four years. 
And there are some competitive research grants that you might want to look at, uh, which also include foreign collaboration. But the money there is, as I said, um, uh, only capped at about eight to 20 million rupees, park rupees each. Let's uh, look at our uh, National Institute of Health and, uh, and the Pakistan Medical Research Council, then the Health Research Council that came into uh, the NIH. And if you look at the grant summary over the period 2000, and I would say 16 to 17, uh, it is really negligible with only external funding that came into the NIH. The NIH received virtually nothing for research uh, allocations and was actually told to not fund research. And therefore there's been virtually no funding that came out of the Health Research Council. When, when the board revamped the Health Research Institute, and uh, I'm very grateful to General Amir, who I hope uh, is attending because he sh shared with me also what has happened in the last one year with Health Research Institute funding. We've been able to allocate close to around hundred million rupees uh, with one round completely funded and the other round funded also and about to be finalized and also some money allocated for a major national uh, survey of importance. So although this is not a ton of money, but it is money which is not there before and has been given and for each one of these allocations, uh, there are hundreds of applications. So there are people out there who uh, uh, are interested and in investing in research. The major body that funds research in Pakistan in academia is the Higher Education Commission. And it's the main funding model for universities that has been established and put in place. And despite all restrictions has done a phenomenal job in my opinion. Very early on in uh, uh, the life of the Higher Education Commission, uh, the money was spent on infrastructure, brick and mortar, setting up laboratories, buying equipment, because all of that had gone down the drain. And you can see how for information technology at early stages, a lot of resources were allocated to just giving people the lifeline to have broadband, to have internet availability and to have equipment for communication, something that all our universities can be very proud of now. But this was not there in the early 2000s and, and full marks and credit to um, uh, the leadership of the Higher Education Commission that it made this happen. And today, no university is starved of information technology resources. The areas of focus for research for the Higher Education Commission, however, have evolved over time. And the mainstay has been the National Research Program for Universities, NRPU. And the others have come over time intermittently, and I'll speak about them. And I'm only going to show you the trends and the total amount of money available under each and for today's discussion. And this particular audience have converted all those monies to US dollars, so you can understand. So the NRPU as a national program, on average has about eight to $10 million every year allocated for research support to universities. To my disappointment, uh, despite all uh, talk, uh, the government that's just um, gone uh, reduced the allocation for research for national universities quite substantially. You can see that it reduced it by half. And that I think was very unfortunate. And in my opinion, it largely emanated from a lack of science leadership uh, um, within the Ministry of Science and Technology and also uh, problems that occurred in terms of support to the Higher Education Commission. There are other bodies of uh, other areas of funding, patent support program, uh, virtually negligible, although this difference looks large. This is only about uh, a couple of hundred thousand dollars. We had a program in collaboration with the US government, uh, which was uh, uh, you know, only about $4 million on, and it finished by 2018-19. Uh, we then saw the emergence of three major tracks of funding last year, year before last. And, and these were significant fundings because they offered universities and departments to compete. One of those was a grand challenge fund with a total funding envelope of about $5 million with World Bank support. And it funded these particular areas. But I must say that the overall applications in these various disciplines, which are even broader than health or health related disciplines was very variable. 
These were grand challenges, uh, which gave up to close to around half a million dollar of funding to everybody who can, who could put together a good application. But we also had $4 million put together for local challenge funds. And we are just finalizing some of those grants as we speak. Uh, around a million dollars for technology transfer. And in the middle of COVID-19, a rapid research grant process for supporting COVID-19 research, about $600,000. So you put it all together in terms of how much allocation for research there has been in the Higher Education Commission over time. Um, it is south of $20 million annually, which is better than what it was in the early 2000s when there was hardly any money, but it could be significantly improved in a country like Pakistan where there is so much need and so much demand for research support. But this is not the only source of funding. Universities are open to compete for international funding. And I'm going to give you two examples. Um, my own university, for example, if you look at this, on average has been able to garner over 20, $25 million every year from external grant funding. So, you know, almost the, more than the budget that the ATC has and about equivalent to the budget of the Ministry of Science and Technology through competitive grants that faculty write and get. And it's not just private sector universities like Aga Khan. I'm very proud to be able to say that, you know, from my own province of origin, Khyber Medical University, I'm grateful to Ziaul Haq, who has shared these data with me, has been able to raise over the last couple of years over $5 million in research funding. So, you know, you know, Pakistan has no money research. I mean, you know, obviously, you don't depend upon the government for funding only, but you are free to write competitive grants and bring funds in and to collaborate with colleagues outside too. And most of these, as Zia may want to speak to, are collaborative grants. So it brings me towards the latter end of my talk as to what are we looking at? What is the role of the diaspora? And this is a complicated issue because the diaspora for Pakistanis is pretty wide and broad. And if you look at the Ministry of Overseas Pakistanis, it has granular detail on where the overseas Pakistanis are. So I'm only going to look at a few countries, uh, which I think are the developed countries where you would expect science-based financing and science-based efforts to be so the European, North American, United Kingdom. And uh, uh, the numbers of Pakistanis in UK and US far outstrips anybody else. So I think there are about eight some million Pakistanis abroad. And if you look at these numbers here, two and a half or thereabouts are in these geographies. Uh, the, in terms of remittances, um, these two countries, UK and United States, far outstrip anybody. Between them, they have about $8 billion every year being remitted to Pakistan. And the United States in particular um, uh, remits the max. Um, but I have not been able to find. I tried very hard to see if there was information from the diaspora in terms of how many Pakistani scientists are out there in these various countries in any discipline, health, science, physics, and that uh, information is not readily available and where it's available, it is very varied. But we do know that in the US, the large proportion of Pakistani origin people live around the coast and, uh, and many of them have academic positions and many of them have collaborations and uh, are interested in building collaborations in Pakistan. And, uh, and therefore, I look upon all of this as a glass, which is probably a little more than half full. So how can we fill this glass? What can the diaspora do to contribute? So I talked about national priorities that the government and many other practitioners in Pakistan have come up with. But if you look at where I think areas that are ripe for collaboration, I would pick these eight areas as where the diaspora may be interested in supporting the country. And I've done this with a good eye on where there are gaps and lack of capacities. So certainly around advanced epidemiology, advanced analytics, modeling, geospatial analysis, there is a tremendous need for handholding in the country and a need for people working in the West to reach out to, to uh, uh, their fellow counterparts. Uh, low cost diagnostics, development and testing, very important area and particularly around national priorities. Intelligent use of technology to support health systems, big data analytics, AI based solutions. These are all things which are 
very important to, to move forward with. NCDs, tremendous need for better research in NCDs. Supporting large-scale clinical trials, including inclusion of genomics research, which has been quite an ethical challenge in many places. Vaccine development, this is a personal interest of mine. I've been working on this for two decades to try and see if we can get things going. And finally, one area in which I'm just beginning our, our work on looking at climate change and health because it's such an existential threat for Pakistan. But I want to take a pause and just give you a few thoughts on what should you not be doing. What should researchers based in the West, read that as let's say North America and Europe, should not be doing when you do research collaboration in Pakistan? The first thing is, please do not do parachute research, which means that you come in, do your project and then disappear, or come in with something which has no link with what is happening on the ground. And that kind of research is generally considered now as a thing of the past. And it's part of our decolonization effort that we, that we accuse other people of. And I certainly wouldn't want our diaspora to be doing research of this kind. <laughs> don't sell coal to Newcastle. Don't come and teach people how to manage things which are common, locally available, where they have far more experience than other people. And at least in my own discipline of pediatrics, I've seen that time and time again, people want to go and teach people how to manage diarrhea or how to manage rehydration. And that's not something that uh, uh, Pakistanis don't know. Academics don't know how to do. So take knowledge in areas where there are knowledge gaps and be respectful of some of the capacities that exist in the country. There are ground realities that you have to be very aware of and ground realities include the fact that you will have to do research in the middle of clinical care volumes, work and practice pressure that is unlike anything else. And also the time that it takes to th get things done. In many universities here, there are established protocols, established research offices where there are not those things, uh, with the exclusion of a few institutions, things will take time. So be respectful of those ground realities because they don't mean anything more than just being flexible. Uh, one thing that I have over the last few years uh, experienced, and I can tell you that, that people bring in projects at times which are ethically questionable and not possible to do them in their own areas. And they think it may be just easy and possible to do it here. Pakistan is not the only country where we have faced these issues. Uh, so do remember that there are ethical oversight processes and we should not be pushing things that would not get approvals elsewhere. Um, I don't have to tell this group as to why they should not be condescending, but I will say that don't impose esoteric research that has little scope for implementation or scale. Bringing projects of a kind that are not necessarily relevant to national realities or have no hope of being scaled up. And I deal with this all the time. I mean, we have got I, uh, and I don't want to take names, but we've got projects of the kind that talk about personalized genomic medicine in Pakistan right now, which really is light years away, even from North America. So those kind of projects can therefore not be very competitive at this stage. One final not, do not do issue relates to the expectation that national funding will some or the other support salaries for people outside or will provide consultancy monies and things. In general, because research funding is limited, I don't think it's possible to send money outside of Pakistan. So uh, we have faced this recently. I do not think any of the collaborators who want to come and do research in Pakistan should expect to be paid for that research outside of Pakistan. Maybe getting their costs covered, travel, local expenses, all of that is possible, but the, the, uh, the money is largely meant for national support and actual work. And we are doing a lot of work right now on due diligence on salaries. We, you know, we have put caps on many things to make sure that the money is actually spent on research. So what are the pointers that I can give to this group as maybe some issues to think of as you take things forward? So the first pointer that I would say is, is uh, spend time building relationships and understanding local priorities and limitations. And it may require visits and knowledge and, and personal linkages, um, support research capacity development, particularly now post-pandemic, we all know how to use technology tools and Zoom, 
And there is absolutely no reason why many of the areas that I've talked about cannot have courses, cannot have web-based blended workshops, et cetera. Uh, and I think many of these workshops that were very expensive to organize before the pandemic can now be organized very easily. And you start with the medical schools where we need a lot of support around things like grant writing, basic epidemiology, study design, and, and medical writing and publishing. Um, I think leveraging your existing resources from, from the North for international research means also that you have better access to information on what the NIH funds, what the CIHR funds in Canada, uh, what the MRC funds in the UK, the Wellcome Trust, make those opportunities available to your collaborators and partners. And many, unlike 10, 15 years ago, many of these grants now are possible to directly fund institutions in Pakistan. I personally think it's totally fine to start with your alma matrix where you have relationships, but don't restrict it to them only. Remember that we do need to expand beyond just a handful of institutions to use the opportunity of research across the board. I would also say that our national institutions, particularly the National Institute of Health, the Health Research Institute there is a tremendous platform on which you can expand. And I would certainly encourage people to reach out to the NIH, which is at this point in time, very receptive. And, and General Amir is, has always got his door open. I will make the case that the research that you want to do is probably best done through your trainees and students. They are the people who will build long-term relationships and establish roots there. Over the last 12 years, I have probably had five or six of my PhD students work in Pakistan on projects that have been several years in the making. And it's a win-win situation because they then develop personal linkages and for their own careers, will always look upon further research in Pakistan through the diaspora uh, 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 very positively. And, and then, I would say to you, be optimistic, be patient, be positive. We only have one country of origin and therefore whatever we can do, it's easy to criticize things, but you need to have a long-term look to see how things have improved and changed over time. Life expectancy has gone up in Pakistan. There are things now available in areas where we could not even dream of 20, 30 years ago. I've just been looking at how many neonatal pediatricians are available now in Pakistan in, in, um, uh, in districts where we had none. And it is actually far better than what I had imagined when I established the fellowship program in the early 2000s. So things change and things change for the better over time. So there is no room for despondency and no room for hopelessness. And I want to finish therefore by citing my favorite poet who said this much better than others. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zulafkar Bhutta, for this excellent, truthful overview of what is going on in health sector in Pakistan and how people from here can help and not help. Um, I think if uh, Dr or General Amir is in the audience somewhere, will he please promote him so that we can ask him a few questions? If not, I will introduce our, uh, I already did, but I will have them if they want to have a few questions or just tell them a few things about them. So Shahid, Shahid Rafiq, uh, please go ahead. Mm -hmm. Salaam alaikum, thank you. Uh, excellent presentation. We, we've been uh, listening and hearing and in conversation with Dr. Zulfkar Bhutta, for many years now, but this was a good um, summary and a great overview. Um, I, I would yield my time to more um, people in the panel and audience who are related to public health as well as research. Uh, but just for a, from merit point of view, uh, I would say, Dr. Bhutta, that we in the past few years uh, actually have pivoted from just giving lectures, like you said, teaching them diarrhea or management of diarrhea to more uh, capacity building, more you know, institutional collaboration, more policy um, uh, involvement. And, and in particular, 
from last year, as you know, we have pivoted more to the healthcare innovations. So we think we can do a lot with uh, our resources, like you said, that reimbursement or remittance are most from USA. And those remittance, uh, we don't know where they go. Uh, sorry, but uh, we don't know where do those remittances go, whether in the uh, real estate or, or other businesses or just family and friends. But I think if these remittances and more is directed toward uh, more medical devices, pharma, vaccine, like you said, um, that would be a really meaningful, uh, meaningful investment uh, on behalf of the Pakistani diaspora. So we definitely would like to do that. You also uh, last year, um, uh, uh, wish, uh, you know, expressed your desire that you wanted to have a list of scientists from North America, in particular USA. And um, uh, we probably work on that as well, uh, who are interested in research. But, uh, but what we are talking about, the innovation in healthcare, that also involves research uh, uh, around those projects, uh, whether it's pharma or vaccine or um, medical devices. So, um, so with that, thank you very much for your uh, you know, great talk. I'll yield my time to others. Uh, in particular, I would like also Dr. Um, uh, Ziaul Haq uh, from Haber uh, VC to also speak some, and uh, Umar has some, has some question. Mustafa Siddiqui is here, a great researcher. Yeah, I think let's Dr. Kalimullah say a few words, then we go to Mustafa and Umar Hayat and so on. And then there is also a very interesting question in Q&A. Yeah, which I would I'll like begin. to answer that. Yeah, so Dr. Kalimullah, a few, few seconds of your intro. Oh, Asalaamu Alaikum, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. It is a really difficult task to follow Dr. Butta, uh, but uh, your, your presentation is uh, spot on, absolutely true. Uh, just, some, just some ideas that I had. Uh, I've been in, in public health uh, and healthcare admin now for a little over 20 years, so uh, do have some insights. And uh, many of the things that Dr. Butta pointed out are, like I said, they are, they are right on mark. Uh, back in 2017, uh, Brookings Institution did a, uh, a study on health governance capacity on 18 low and middle income countries that included Pakistan, Bangladesh, India, Indonesia, Vietnam, and there were other 11 other African nations. And all I can say is thank God for Nigeria. Pakistan was <laughs> say, second to last on it. And they, they, they reviewed a, a lot of metrics. Uh, and, and as Dr. Butta pointed out, many of the things were there, but Pakistan lacked in health management capacities, policies, uh, regulations, uh, infrastructure and financing, and, and health systems. So what I have been doing uh, through the auspices of APNA, and, and I'm very thankful that APNA has given me multiple opportunities to, to go to Pakistan and, and present, I've been doing uh, a number of things, not just on immunizations, uh, uh, but more recently on uh, how to improve our health systems. Uh, one of the concepts is uh, a high reliability organization. And, and so uh, having, having some insight into this, uh, I've been uh, helping uh, go to different hospitals and talk about them. Uh, and 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 so on and so forth. So what I can what I can talk about is my individual experience, um, uh, and and because of COVID, everything stopped. You know, and even in in the United States, uh, when COVID first started, uh, we did not have tests. So as my lead in in uh, in the eight hospitals that I cover, it was very very difficult to get even uh, you know. Uh, all, all the tests and don't talk about tests. We couldn't get uh, nasal swabs. Uh, yeah. Nasal Dr. swabs got into- Dr. Kalimullah, uh, sorry, to, sorry to interrupt. Let me introduce other panelists for a few minutes and then sure, we have sure. questions. Yeah. So uh, uh, Umar Hayat, do you want, do you have a comment, please? Umar is one of very senior scientists and pharmacists and chemical engineers somewhere in Napa Valley. Go ahead, Umar. 
Thank you very much, Dr. Rao. Uh, Dr. Bhutta, amazing presentation. Um, thank you very much uh, for sharing the lights, um, like what's going on in Pakistan and how uh, the diaspora can help. Um, I, I will say I'm not a fan of uh, government funding, uh, even though it's very essential to do the fundamental research. Uh, so one question I always have is, uh, how the government uh, or academia can work with the industry because that's where the applied um, technologies or sciences will emerge. So the question I asked was like uh, what the government is doing because those funding should be tied with some sort of percentage coming from the, uh, from the industry. So this way you've kind of forced the academicians to, to approach to the industry oh. and um, uh, projects together. So that would be the only question I will have. I think uh, Dr. Rafiq mentioned uh, uh, very clearly uh, that particularly the APNA has changed its focus. I mean, they are, we are moving away from just the workshops, but we are setting up some uh, investment funds where we can work in collaboration with the industry as well as uh, with the academia in Pakistan. So that's a great initiative. Uh, we very well heard you that uh, what we should do and what we should not do. Uh, we should be very respectful uh, the local talent we have. Uh, but it's also very important, actually, uh, the exposure we have, how we can bring this back to Pakistan. So those uh, are the comments. Thank you. thank you, Omar. I think quickly let's answer a couple of questions. Then we'll go to Mustafa. Or Mustafa, you want to ask a question right away now to Dr. Bhutta? Yeah. Uh, alaikum. Uh, so um, um, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Bhutta, and, uh, and, and thank you for sharing that interesting slide about the H index, uh, about which really tells us about the importance of pu publication. It's not the idea is just to publish, the idea is to have impactful research. So that was interesting how we compared to India. And uh, it was, uh, and we really uh, were uh, in, a, in a good standing at that uh, regard. And I felt very optimistic. So, I, so my, um, uh, I've been involved with APNA uh, in research and um, I think we have done a great job um, in research education over these merit-based seminars, which we have done in, in every week. And, uh, uh, and like you said that uh, there are multiple resources in Pakistan in which uh, uh, you, you can approach and, uh, and get the required skill set. I think our next frontier and something which I would say that our main go-to out of this meeting should be that um, we should be working towards having a database of Pakistani researchers and Ameri uh, the, the Pakistani researchers in America and, uh, and share these databases, connect them with each other so that, uh, I mean, my field is Parkinson's. So if I have to uh, develop any Parkinson's collaborations, I know who to contact, who are the big hitters and who they are. So that, sh that, that should be my main uh, thing. We should have a follow-up on how to uh, proceed forward. One thing, and I always, I'm in, I'm in operations. So uh, one thing which is important in operations is how do you implement that idea? And that is to develop a, uh, so uh, I, I was looking at, we use RedCap at Big Forest University and and there are multiple uh, universities in America which use REDCap. I saw that Al Khan and two other places in Pakistan also use REDCap, which is a free database available. So it's like no expenditure, uh, um, and uh, and we can develop this database in REDCap at APNA end as well as uh, you guys in Pakistan, and and then at least we can connect uh, the researchers with each other. Uh, that that is all what I wanted to say. So th thank you, Mustafa. So Dr. Bhutta, at this point, there are a few questions coming. Maybe you can answer to a few comments from now. Then we'll take those questions. And since you asked me this morning, how many people will attend at highest level of your uh, of your like stocks? We were at eighty four. Right now, we're still hammering around eighty people. So there are at least. Yeah, it's all right. It's the quality that counts, not the numbers. <laughs> I but know, I, I, know, know, but, I, I, but I hope that the message gets yeah. through. So, uh, so uh, please uh, go ahead. Go ahead, Dr. Bhutan. Okay. Um, 
I assume everybody knows Urdu, so I will try and, and, and speak in English actually, all right? There's a question out there on commercial conflicts of interest, et cetera. I think we now have processes in place in most reasonable universities, ethics committees, and also centrally at the National Research Ethics Oversight, plus in draft to, to see through some of the major conflicts. My issue in many of these industry related uh, projects that I see in the Higher Education Commission is lack of seriousness. I mean, people produce a letter from an industry uh, representative, but without really serious investments. If you industry representatives about Pakistan is serious, serious pharma industry, they lament on this quality of, uh, of many of the academic collaborations that they have. But I think things have moved in the right direction. Uh, before the previous government uh, disbanded uh, hurriedly, a number of things had been put in place to see how we could improve the drug regulatory authorities' performance, draft performance. And without divulging too many details, there is a lot of work uh, uh, ongoing on trying to see how we can increase resources for draft and also the quality of oversight within it, not in a way to obstruct, but in a way to promote those kind of, I completely agree with the, with the uh, suggestion that government pe sirf depend karna research ke liye hamakat hai. It uh, will not serve the purpose and therefore we would, uh, I would personally very strongly encourage bringing in the industry, the private sector and international uh, bodies, but to do it in a way that fulfills the principle of the kind of research that we are talking about. Research has to benefit the common person. If you do it for drug development or trials in areas where then obviously one people will question it. So just like for vaccines, when we vaccine trial, the first question is, is this vaccine going to be affected by the nas? So I think those fundamental principles of post-trial benefits, of uh, standards of care, of what has already been approved. And if something is not approved in the country of origin, to have it tested in Pakistan is a big challenge. Not that it's impossible, but it is a big challenge. So those things have to be uh, looked at. There's a question on data transfers. I mean, I they can Pakistan ka sabse bada advantage is forget comparative advantage kya hai, uh, without naming anything, but both on our Eastern borders and Western borders, is that ke we have a very open policy on data transfer agreements. We have a very open policy on biology, biological specimens uh, that can be sent out. You cannot send a single biology specimen out of India. Because regulations specimen and they try and force everybody to do the relevant investigations within India. As a result, you know. A lot of the research on many of the new cutting edge tools would not have taken place. So in Pakistan, we have been light ahead of others because we have built those collaborations. This doesn't mean that technology transfer na ho, but there is a flexibility. So for you, there is a feasibility in Pakistan. You can research this way, you can have data transfer agreements ki flexibility ho, or biological specimen transfers ki flexibility. Ho, and there is now a regulation in there as, as, as uh, was uh, uh, identified. Um, maybe I'm missing a question, uh, Bavar, because all the things you've done, maybe I've missed one of them. What have you missed one of them? No, I think most of them you have answers, but uh, Mustafa yeah. had a question. Mustafa, do you want to ask again? Has that been answered? Uh, 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 Professor Butta, in, in terms of action items, my, my proposal was that we have to have a database of collecting the Pakistani researchers uh, with the yeah, yeah, yeah. American researchers. Okay, sorry, I got it. Uh, so Mustafa, that's the Pakistan side. Maybe three, four years out of date, hogi. but PCST her sal, her three years baad, two, three years baad, a directory banati hai, highly productive scientists ki. Ab usme pehle ye hota raha hai ke people have to send their data in. Or kai university mein active research, unka time nahi hota, bej, bejte hi nahi. But but there is a decent uh, directory of health scientists. Is sal humne pehli baar effort kiya hai. And uh, my own uh, Aachen University is making a, a big investment in this is to use, uh, you know, AI 
एंड सम ऑफ द टूल्स अवेलेबल के लोगों के इसके ना वो डेटा भेजने के बजाय आप ऑटोमेटिकली जिस तरह गूगल स्कॉलर करता है मैं मैं गूगल स्कॉलर को अपना डेटा तो नहीं भेजता हूं ना जस्ट माइन इट स्टैनफोर्ड वाले भी दे जस्ट टेक इट फ्रॉम स्कोपस दैट देयर कैन बी ए डेटाबेस ऑफ साइंटिस्ट्स विद एफिलिएशंस विद एरियाज ऑफ फोकस विद वेदर और नॉट दे हैव कोलैबोरेशंस तो ये जो नेटवर्क मैप मैंने आपको बताया था कोलैबोरेशंस का ये इस तरह ही किया गया क्लैरिवेट एनालिटिक्स जो भी करते हैं दे यूज एआई एंड क्लाउड कंप्यूटिंग टू डू दिस सो इट इज नाउ बिकम इजीयर इजीयर not easy easier to do this and i think apna ko bhi ye sochna chahiye ki maybe work out a collaboration with some academic body to do this quickly for pakistani origin scientists in north america kyunki pakistan mein inshallah isi saal mein and i hope that the health data center at nih will be in place to do this we will have all of that information readily available jis tarah aap keh rahe hain who is working on movement disorders we will give you that information not for practitioners only but for practitioners who have published or who have grants or who have international collaborations i think that's a decent start uh, and that will give you an idea ke kaun kis field mein kaam kar raha hai so and the second thing is of course that you can go through specialist bodies like societies and uh, and associations to get that information also but i think what you are interested in is ke kaun productive scientist hai and that we will be able to provide मतलब बाबर एक आ, आ, मैं थोड़ा सा डॉक्टर उमर हयात के क्वेश्चन की तरफ वापस आना चाह रहा हूँ आई थिंक इट वॉज आर आई थिंक बट आई अंडरस्टैंड उमर क्वेश्चन डॉक्टर भुट्टा इज दैट इफ यू नो आई नो दिस इज हिज पैशन टू टू डिवेलप मोर फार्मा रिसर्च एंड आर एंड डी इन पाकिस्तान एंड दैट मे लीड टू ऑब्वियसली वैक्सीन एंड अदर uh what i think he is asking is there a initiative at this point where the uh where the private sector pharma and uh, and academia and the foreign investors come together not as much government but uh go ahead umar if you if if it's not the question i i wanted that to be answered by dr butta that's that's exactly the question i mean not only just to help to forge the uh, three way collaborations um i, I can tell you i was uh, outsourcing some development work to pakistan and the uh, then my uh, ceo he asked that can we get the sample of the product they have formulated because we want to match the skin color uh, believe me or not uh, the guy went to the three different couriers and they were not able to ship even a sample out because they said everybody is a drug so i think the but my expectation is even if they cannot help with the fund or anything but they can help uh, facilitate the work um, especially when it comes to the people like us who wants to work with the uh, with the people in pakistan because very often in research and in particularly in in pharma research it's not always about just what they have written on the paper uh, we we really want to see the samples we really want to do the retesting of those samples and it has been terribly difficult to get anything out of pakistan and or shipped to the pakistan and that that has been the challenge and i think that's where uh, we seek the help from the government yes. doctor next time mujhe koi instance ho na aisa mujhe specifically aap batayega dekhen uh, <laughs> industry mein bonafide reasonable well established industry partners bhi hain aur do nambariyan bhi hain ab i don't know ke aap kis example ki baat kar rahe hain but if you run into an issue like that uh, run it by me and i'll do the best i can to get but i can't believe for a moment that uh, nobody is able to ship uh, specimens because there is no regulation that prevents this unless it's proprietary material or or something that they don't have a data transfer or material transfer agreement with you so uh, i think in cheezon ka solution hai so koi law isko forbid nahi karta aur jahan tak aapki baat hai drap ki capacity ki main agree karta hu isse ki drap mein capacity limited hai but zero nahi hai and what the mod- the modality that drap has is that they generally set up a committee aur us committee mein aap kafi reasonable log hain main chunke khud kaam karta raha hu unke sath on emergency use authorizations main dekha ki they do take advice uh, and they do take a, a consultative process pretty seriously 
um but you know as i said everything takes time ame jo sabse bada jo drap mein challenge tha was on the leadership of drap kitna time laga just to get an you know a head of drap it might ke kitna time laga you know saal lag gaye kai and that's the kind of challenge that you face particularly in a in a country jahan ke wo tradition nahi hai ke political change ke sath sath institutional change zaruri nahi hai ab main my biggest worry right now is that we are beginning to see that ki interim ye jo government aayi hai bhi it is beginning to change a number of things and some of those are expected but some of those are unnecessary for example you know uh, technical technical people should not be moved uh, so frequently that it makes a mockery out of policy and ye baaki jo mamalik hain inki main baat kar raha tha bangladesh as an example government change ho na change ho unke apne policies aur program change nahi hote and india mein bhi yahi hai so um let's see let's see ke kis tarah ye aage ja sakte hain but ek jo bada advantage jo pakistan mein aa gaya hai wo ye ke ek taraf government hai ek taraf private sector hai you have private sector you have private sector universities koi qabahat nahi hai collaborative research mein you just have to bring the right idea and you have to bring the right partners to the table and for every uh, let's say dysfunctional industry partner there are 10 really highly commendable international stature ke industry partners national industry ki baat kar raha hu main kyunki who i know personally and i know that they are very interested in r and d uh, and there is no reason why the health sector should be far behind the it sector ab dekhen is waqt success stories out of pakistan in it startups young people you know 20 25 saal ke bachche jo hain they are millionaires right now why because they have had the enterprise entrepreneurship आपने अपने अपना मेरिट प्रोग्राम में कितनी खातन को जगा दी है जो हु हैड द विजडम टू जस्ट यू नो स्टेप आउट ऑफ द रट एंड स्टार्ट समथिंग अ फ्रेश एंड सक्सेस वाज देयर अगर ये इंफॉर्मेशन टेक्नोलॉजी में हो सकता है अगर दीगर चीजों में हो सकता है इंडस्ट्री नॉन हेल्थ इंडस्ट्री में हो सकता है टेक्सटाइल में मैं देख रहा हूं ये आजकल आई मीन लॉट्स लॉट्स ऑफ यंग पीपल हैव ब्रॉट आइडियाज एंड हैव सक्सीडेड व्हाई कांट दिस हैपन इन हेल्थ it can absolutely help in in health and as my friend was saying health management is a right area uh, you know health resources and health technology is a right area uh, biotechnology pharma yahi mauka hai because ek to sabse bada advantage pakistan mein ye hai ki ji 200 se zyada million ki population hai and many of the regional landlocked countries are potentially great markets for pakistan sirf afghanistan hi the entire central asia अगर आप स्थान्स में चले जाएं तो वहां अगर अगर हमारे पास गुंजाइश हो तो साइंस हो वी हैव रेडी मार्केट आउट देयर सो इस वक्त जरूरत है लोगों को ले जाने की नॉर्थ अमेरिका से एंड टू शो देम व्हाट कैन बी डन एंड टू बी ब्रेव थैंक यू आई थिंक बाबर हैड टू लीव बट uh if there are uh, some uh, if if dr butta has some time i know you are I busy have time. with family i have time <laughs> not an so, issue uh, so because it's so, uh, so, uh, so, um, uh, really a uh, great um, uh, you know seeing so much interest and like dr butta said that it's not quantity but i see a lot of quality i know some of the attendees personally they are really really great from different institution can we ask uh, walid uh, ziaul uh, ziaul hak i make a last comment yeah. uh, yeah, yeah, sure. go ahead allowed. in the meantime yeah, walid can you give mic to ziaul hak uh, if he, if he has a comment you go ahead umar yeah. so dr buka but my suggestion would be I mean, we know uh, draf has the lack of resources and in particular i will have to mention the expertise so there is no harm to establish the extended committees is the people from north side of the country uh, participate and it doesn't need to meet like every week so i think each of us can spare some time for our beloved country uh, it can be on the need basis or it can be uh, once in a month or once in a quarter so i think that could be a one way to mitigate what they are facing in terms of the lack of expertise and okay uh, i agree with you sir and i think uh, i we are the guinea pigs i mean hamare nih ka board is an example ke pehli baar history mein pakistan ke they established an international board jisme ke aadhe se zyada members jo hain wo pakistan se bahar based hain full time i mean they are come to pakistan they are of pakistani origin but we have had since we started last april 
over 33 meetings using technology and face to face meetings what have you aap mujhe bataye koi aisa ek board hai pakistan mein jisme logon ne itna time diya ho kisi ek national body ko aur itni frustrating situation mein jahan ki you know there is lack of personnel and the need to do a lot more so wo ek tajruba hai if if that succeeds i think it will open the door for many things uh, including what you're talking about is ke draft open its doors to outside reviewers and other people who come in at the higher education commission i've also got them to agree for the first time that you will take reviewers from outside pakistan pakistani jo origin ke log hain jo bahar baithe hue hain they can provide reviews on projects jahan aapke paas national capacity nahi hai that took a little bit of time but at least it's been done so uh, give it time we will uh, you know we will continue to plug on this aap bhi aap log bhi apna pressure jari rakhe we will try and do something from within uh shayad there are three questions uh, in the uh, time nikal jayega main unka jawab de do jo q and a mein yeah hmm? go go ahead so the very important question ek to mere apne area se hai so dr hiba heather has said pakistan is highest infant mortality what are we doing to reverse those numbers uh, well i mean you know pakistan is not one country pakistan is five countries agar aap demographic patterns dekhein to hamare paas baaz aise ilake hain jahan ke living standards are comparable to what you have in many other developed areas and there are parts of the country jahan ke bilkul africa se bhi bure halat hain balochistan ke aap dur iftada ilakon mein chale jaye so ye jo average hamari child mortality ke figures hain they are representative of the enormous diversity in the country that we have and many many areas of the country that have been neglected for for as long as pakistan has been there so things have improved ye bhi nahi hai ki isme progress nahi hai but they need to improve a lot more around areas like newborn mortality so newborn mortality rates are high and we, and that's why you saw ke one of the things that we have done is to is to undertake this thorough analysis ki why is this newborn mortality so high in other areas so there is focus on it and i am personally quite involved and engaged in reversing trying to reverse this um there is a question on uh, phd students and that's a very important question mera khayal tha adnan haider would be here because he wrote a very seminal paper on this in the early 2000 ke pakistan ke phd students ko uh, kya hua uh, dekhen agar har phd student ki ye khwahish ho ke main wapas aake sarkari naukri karunga तो वो तो दुनिया के किसी हिस्से में भी पूरी नहीं हो सकती तो इसका आइडिया यही था हायर एजुकेशन कमीशन का कि अगर आप पीएचडी स्टूडेंट्स प्रोड्यूस कर रहे हैं और भेज रहे हैं उनको तो और उनमें से लेट से 50 परसेंट भी वापस आ जाते हैं सो दे विल बी एकोमोडेटेड इन द प्राइवेट सेक्टर इन द इंडस्ट्री इन मेनी अदर प्लेस इन प्राइवेट यूनिवर्सिटीज सो आई पर्सनली डोंट थिंक द इशू इज के पी एच स्टूडेंट्स के पास नौकरियां नहीं इशू ये है कि पी स्टूडेंट्स कितने तैयार हैं नॉन गवर्नमेंट जॉब्स लेने के लिए मसला यही है हमारा कि अगर हर एक चाहता है कि उसको सरकारी नौकरी मिले और फिर देर फॉर वो जॉब सिक्योरिटी हो गई कोई काम किए बगैर पैसे मिलेंगे तो वो चीज नहीं हो सकती वो कहीं भी नहीं हो सकती दुनिया में बट वाई कॉन्ट पी एच डी स्टूडेंट कम्पीट फॉर पोजिशन इन प्राइवेट सेक्टर यूनिवर्सिटीज एंड एकेडीमिया मैं आपको बताऊँ इस वक्त बेसिक साइंस में अगर लोगों ने पी एच डी की और पाकिस्तान आए सवाल ही पैदा नहीं होता कि नौकरी ना मिले इतनी शॉर्टेज हमारे मेडिकल कॉलेजेस में बेसिक साइंटिस्ट भी सो आई आई थिंक दिस इज नॉट एन इशू दैट इज ए रियल चैलेंज इट्स इट्स अ क्वेश्चन ऑफ मैचिंग एंड देन अगेन मेनी पीएचडी स्टूडेंट्स हैव नो इंटेंशन ऑफ कमिंग बैक टू पाकिस्तान सो अनफॉर्चुनेटली दैट्स द रियलिटी मेनी पीपल वांट टू हैव हायर एजुकेशन फॉर इकोनॉमिक अपॉर्चुनिटीज एंड दे डोंट कम बैक टू द कंट्री बट मेनी डू आल्सो आई कम फ्रॉम एन इंस्टीट्यूशन जहां के इस वक्त अगर आप देखें तो हमारे मेजोरिटी ऑफ डिपार्टमेंट चेयर जो है हमारे अपने ग्रेजुएट्स जो कि बाहर से करके आए हैं वो दे हैव कम बैक टू द कंट्री डेटा बेसिस कैन बी एक्सप्लोर ये एन आई एच करेगा जी ये हेल्थ डेटा सेंटर जो है उसमें दे आर देर आर प्लान टू एस्टेब्लिश ऑल काइंड ऑफ डेटा बेसिस एंड ब्रिंग दंस देट आर डिस्पर्स टूगेदर इट विल टेक टाइम रेगुलेशन फॉर डायग्नोस्टिक्स आर आर प्रटी मिनिमल इन द सेंस के ये Uh, as as umar was saying drap mein itni capacity nahi hai is waqt ke wo diagnostics and and technology khas taur pe medical use technology ko bada separately evaluate kar so there is a committee that looks at it and there is a lot of market for diagnostics at this point in time that work 
So that's why I put it down in my bucket list of, of topics as one of the most important topics that we have for development R&D. If serious kism ke researchers or or investigators in North America mein, not the the thranasis of the world, but really serious kism ke jo log kar rahe hai, kaam, is pe bahut opportunity hai, clinical trials ki, evaluations ki, aur market bhi hai. I'll give you the example. Uh, I think jitna paisa Malaysia ne Pakistan mein kamaya hai from its diagnostic on typhoid, shayad kisi aur mulk mein kamaya ho. Beshek chai wo itni hachi hai quality ka product nahi tha, but they were able to do it 20 years ago. So uh, there's no reason why we cannot have work on diagnostics in the country. The regulations for this are standard regulations, but not very tough. Okay. Thank you. Um, I, I would like to, in the end, I think, uh, give a chance to um, uh, Dr. Ziaul Haq from uh, VC Haber University to, to give some comments. If the, he has a question, he has been a great friend of Apna Merit. Uh, go ahead, uh, Ziaul Haq. Thank you. But the, uh, uh, Professor Bhutta beautifully summarized uh, some things that story mere zain mein bhi kuch cheeze, missing link the to aaj alhamdulillah missing link unhone bahut start se shuru kiya aur abhi ek story uh, complete ho gayi jo unhone badi khoobsurat andaaz se bataya and i'm very happy to report ke uh, jo 5000 log bahar bheje the jo phd number of phd wo jo wapas aaye tremendous talent main pure pakistan ki jitni university hai main ki quality assurance ka ke president bhi hu aur main har mahine taqreeban do teen university visit karta hu aur abhi main last month jo hai sindh ke andar char panch university mein khairpur ke andar humne ek international conference kiya tremendous talent hai issues to hai ki university ke leadership ke andar thode issues zarur hai ki wahan jo vice chancellor hai jo wahan ka aur ek office hai ki agar researcher paise leta hai तो फंडिंग के इशू यह है कि आप इस पैसों को खर्च भी कर सके तो अब जैसे मेरी यूनिवर्सिटी है यहां 20 लोग थे वापस आए हैं और हमने एक माहौल ऐसा बनाया है वहां ओरेक का जो ऑफिस है कि हम फंडिंग का एक अलग अलग हमने फ्लो बनाया है विद इन द जो सरकारी लिमिट है उसके मुताबिक तो जहां ये चीजें अवेलेबल है तो टैलेंट के इंडिविजुअल जो फैकल्टी ट्रिमेंडस टैलेंट है और मैं प्रोफेसर बुट्टा साहब के साथ ग्रांट्स पे काम भी करता हूं जो जो हम ट्रेंड देख रहे हैं जो क्वालिटी ऑफ प्रपोजल्स हैं अमेजिंग अमेजिंग के आप देखेंगे कि उनके अंदर जो प्रपोजल आइडिया आपके पास आते हैं तो आई थिंक के एक जो पब्लिक हेल्थ की बात करूंगा कि पब्लिक हेल्थ के अंदर भी जब हम लोग वापस आए तो हम कोई 8 10 ही पीएचडी थे कोई थे ही नहीं मास्टर और डिप्लोमा के ऊपर काम हो रहा था अभी मेरे मेजॉरिटी ऑफ स्टूडेंट इसमें सुन भी रहे हैं मैं सब सब में तकरीबन 10 12 स्टूडेंट मेरे यहां हैं तो अभी तीन चार यूनिवर्सिटीज हैं जो पीएचडी ऑफर कर रहे हैं हम यहां पे अभी हम मास्टर पब्लिक हेल्थ कर रहे थे हमारे पास चार पांच लोग आते थे अभी पोस्ट कोविड में अगर आपको बताऊं और ये जो ग्रांट्स हमें मिल uske mutabik agar hum chunki uske publicity karte hain to is dafa hamare paas 4 500 student aaye for the, and they are competing for 20 number of phd jo wo hai aur phd ke liye sankdo jo log hain wo apply karte hain to alhamdulillah ek mass density ban raha hai ha hamara uk ke sath europe ke sath zyada collaboration hai than the us apna ke sath hum bahut cheezon pe kaam kare grant pe thoda kam kaam kar rahe hain wo shayad ye hai ke ek to ye tha ki d ने ये मैंडेटरी किया हुआ था कि आपने لازمی वहां के यूनिवर्सिटीज को लेना है और जैसे प्रोफेसर बुट्टा ने बात की कि वहां के यूनिवर्सिटीज को लीडरशिप का रोल देना है अभी तक जितना भी हमने अप्लाई किया तकरीबन 80% जिसमें हम हम लोग लीड करते हैं वी गॉट दोस फंड्स नॉट विदाउट मेरिट सो लेट मी इंटरप्ट बिकॉज़ आई जिया आई डिड नॉट नोटिस आई शुड हैव नोटिस दैट देयर आर पीपल हु आर नॉन उर्दू स्पीकिंग इन ऑन ऑन इन द ऑडियंस आल्सो and uh, particularly want to welcome paul bara uh, so just to say one thing i know because i headed the committee in the early 2000s at the hec that reviewed health sciences projects proposals it is a different ball game altogether the quality of proposals has improved tremendously there are still gaps there are still issues with the way people write proposals but compared to what it was 20 years ago this is a different ball game altogether so what i am saying and i completely agree with you that you know it takes time and it takes time i mean i'm 
a graduate of Khyber Medical College at that time. And the kind of research proposals that we are seeing now coming out of Khyber Pakhtunkhwa institutions, uh, not just Khyber Medical University, other institutions are head and shoulders above the rest. So it takes a little bit of time, it takes effort, takes patience, and it takes confidence. You know, you have to have confidence in your ability. And then you will be able to get research monies and funding, which in the case of KMU, as I said, is coming from outside Pakistan in, uh, you know, to a large extent. And it's same is the case. I mean, many of you, I mean, Babar has probably left, you know, but we have visited uh, RMU. I mean, Umar is a phenomenal individual, but he has revolutionized Ralpindi Ral Medical College and Ralpindi University now. And it's become a center which is bubbling with activity, which has got a lot of areas around education, capacity development, research, and more power to his elbow. In another 10 years, that will become the place to go for research in that geography. So many, so many other National University of Science and Technology, look at where it is now. So give people time. And this is the time for the diaspora, for people like yourselves who are well endowed, sitting in North America to reach out and develop those links because uska fruit aapko paanch da saal mein milega inshallah very well said uh, i think if there is no more question we are well over time uh, usually we don't but because of uh, so much interest and and great uh, presentation and presence of um, dr bhutta we did that so um, again i would thank uh, dr bhutta in particular and all the panelists uh, in general and and especially the audience you, you made this a really, really interesting um, uh, webinar today. Um, till next time, thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you. Thank you. All the best. Thank you for inviting me. Take care.